I've entitled the lecture Pacing the Heart, from Pacing the Heart to the Pace of Evolution, because the structure of the lecture, which will be that I will first give you an overview very rapidly of my work on the computational biology of the heart, in order to lead up to a very important principle, which I'm then going to use to ask the question, what determines the pace of evolution? So, pacing the heart, first of all. Um, see, I started computing heart activity in 1959. There were two computers in University College London in those days. One was a Brunsviga hand calculator. The other was the Ferranti Mercury valve computer. I have to tell you too that in those days there was no Algol, there was no C++, there was no Java, there wasn't even Fortran. It was tedious. But somehow I worked out very quickly that the first instrument there, the Brunsviga calculator, would have required about two months of calculating to do what would take two hours on the valve computer. So I chose to use the valve computer. And the reason I did that was that I had experimental information on the following channels in the heart. The sodium channel, which had been characterized also in nerve previously by Hodgkin and Huxley, in their marvelous work in 1952, a chloride channel, <coughs> and two types of potassium channel on which I had experimental information. So I wanted to know very simply, was it possible to construct a computer model of the rhythm of the heart using the equations for those four channels? And that led to the 1960, or sometimes called the 1962 model, which did indeed succeed in reproducing the rhythm in the conducting system of the heart, called the Purkinje system, in terms of the variations in the course of time of some of the channels. What you see there is the sodium channel and the two potassium channels. It looks very impressive. In fact, the voltage trace there fits very well to the voltage trace of an experimental recording. So what the answer is very simple. That model is extremely fragile. If that was the rhythm of the heart, you would only have to knock out one of those channels or block it with a drug and the rhythm would stop. If your heart depended on that kind of fragility, you wouldn't be here. So, much later, about 25 years later, working with one of my colleagues, Dari Di Francesco, at a time when we had discovered many other channels in the heart, including one that was involved in the pacemaker rhythm called IF, we discovered also that there were channels called sodium calcium exchangers and, of course, uh, calcium channels. Actually, the calcium channels were first discovered by a German physiologist called Harold Reuter. And mechanisms that are represented, of course, in the genome by the genes which code. So, why do you need them? You see, the 1960 worked. But remember, I said it was fragile. The complexity gives... I can illustrate that now with an interesting experiment that we did on the version of the model that was applied to the real heart pacemaker, the sinus node. What you see here is the rhythm in the sinus node, the voltage trace at the top, and two of the many ion channels that are involved in the rhythm. One is a sodium channel, that's the one that's changing by a lot, and the other is the um, channel that was discovered with Dario Di Francesco. And what I'm doing is knocking out the one that contributes a lot of functionality, the sodium one, progressive. 
60, 80, and then 100% knockout. If that was contributing, a huge change in frequency, possibly even stopping the heart. You don't. There's the robustness. A the control lead you to think there is a 10% functionality if you knock it out or if you block the protein with a chemical, a drug. Now I want you for a moment we work out what genes do. We knock them out and we see what happens. We'll come on to that a little bit later. lecture, which is the consequence of robust mechanisms can be, that's what got me into thinking about the application of those ideas to evolutionary biology. Moreover, you can reverse engineer to find out what the functionality was that made it so robust. A, 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 sorry, a horizontal line under the voltage trace to show that there is a small degree of voltage change and that is precisely what activates the mechanism that is kicking in, the mechanism I've called here. That's the origin of the functionality. So you can not only use computational models to work out why often gene knockouts don't tell you the function, but you can also reverse it to find out what was causing, what was responsible for the robustness. So we now come to the pacing of evolution. Was it, as the original formulators of Darwinism thought, simply random, gradual mutation in the genome followed by slow natural selection? Or was it, as for example people like Eldridge and Gould thought, subject to sudden spurts in evolution, as some people thought the geological record showed? How, in other words, did we get from a whale to, uh, or would we get if we tried to make it happen, uh, from a whale um, to a land animal? And in order to give you this part of the lecture, I'm going to compare two approaches which I characterize as on the one hand the 20th century reductive approach, which is that blind chance mechanism followed by natural selection, which means that evolution has no foresight whatsoever, it's all random chance, with what I call the integrative 21st century view that organisms actually use chance. They harness stochasticity to generate function, in which case, of course, viewed from organisms, evolution does have some direction. ...into four parts. First, I will justify that point about harnessing stochasticity, then talk about how that is used to reorganize genomes, and then to another way in which evolution can be speeded up, which is the inheritance in a information, and then I will return to, to the role of what we can call genetic buffering, because that is what gives rise to the robustness. So, the question is systems approach to complexity become sidelined in the second half of the 20th century. It's very easy to answer that because we know uh, that the use uh, from molecules to man, notice those prepositions are one way, it can't be true. You see, the problem is that molecules are not alive. We can come on to that in discussion if people want to challenge me with that statement. So where did the idea come from? Came, you can trace the idea in many ways to different people, but I trace it back uh, to the uh, great quantum mechanics pioneer, Erwin Schrödinger, who published a major book in around 1943 with the ambitious title, What is Life? It was based on a series of lectures he gave to the Dublin Institute of Advanced Studies. 
And he argued physics, order at the high level from disorder at the low level. You have the motion, the random motion of molecules, molecular level and the levels below, but you have the beautifully, um, it's the word I want, smooth and accurate level analysis using the equations of thermodynamics. Fine. Physics, he thought, was simply order from molecular disorder. But then, biology is completely different. It is order from order. Now, why on earth did he say that? We use to determine the structure of biological molecules. And he used the analogy of a crystal. He thought that wherever the genetic code would be found, whether in proteins or in DNA or whatever, it would be what he called an aperiodic crystal. And if you think of a polymer as a kind of crystal, I know that's a bit of a stretch, but it's aperiodic because clearly the same data, just repeated endlessly, wouldn't be able to be responsible for being the database from which an organism could be constructed. So he thought maybe the genetic material was read in a determinate way, just like X-rays can give you a determinate structure of molecules. That was his metaphor. But does biology generate order? Now, my point is, it can't be true. Schrödinger himself said, in his book, page 101 of What is Life, it's absurd, it can't be true. And then he went on to say, but it must be true. He was struggling, you see, and the issue was, how does DNA copy itself? Of course, he didn't know it was DNA, he didn't know anything about copying. Uh, we can come to any questions later. Taken over by Watson and Crick in the central dogma of molecular biology, with what I call right here to years ago. In both cases, our solution to the problem is that life copes with stochasticity. And the living organism is a process not dependent on and therefore not completely programmed. I would agree with Schrodinger that physics of the time, there are exceptions, The work of um, Huang and his colleagues published in Nature um, degree of stochasticity in a population of cultured cells, they're looking at just one particular protein. It doesn't matter what the protein is, and is expressed is there is that the range of stochasticity is three orders of magnitude. The 1,000 in the low expressors and the high expressors. And it's because if you look at the variation in the distribution over a period of about three weeks, it hardly changes at all. Furthermore, are the beautiful element, you culture the cells either from the second peak in some of the populations that show a double peak, or from the high expressors of a mono distribution, you first of all get daughter cells for a few days of culture that show the expression level of the original cells. But over time, about two or three weeks, you revert to the same of expression. What is happening 
which this could be the case, the population is um, expressing a kind of attractor. How is it used is the interesting question. Very interesting ways in which this all cells today. Your immune system, when it is responding to that it has not met before, will do this. It will select from a range of um, immune system cells to choose the invader. So, my first conclusion is that forms of stochasticity in gene expression are cellular attractors. I haven't in which that can occur. There are various. Um, how can it be used by organisms functionally? Does that today. Now I'm going to go on to show that that had to happen though, there has to be a means by which cells, tissues and organs of the body can react to environmental stress and communicate. How can it If you magnified a cell, a single cell of our bodies, on a scale which represented a molecule as being the size of my fist, the edge of the cell would be way down in Munich. That's the scale we're talking about. At a molecular level, of course you've got those molecules doing all the stochastic Now you've got to communicate from that reaction surface of the membrane, where it must be the case that your detecting system, whether whatever mechanism it is, it's a calcium channel here, but whatever mechanism is at the surface, must be able to communicate down to specific regions of the genome to change gene expression. We now know how that happens. This is simply an image, colored because of its using a fluorescent protein, of the beautiful pathways within cells enable little molecular motors to take a messenger from one part of the cell right the way down through the nuclear membrane to the nucleus. It's no longer a problem to understand how events as far away on a molecular scale as right down there in Munich can be transmitted to the genome up here in uh, Aachen. So, go on now to the role of genetic buffer. You can, the, what I showed you with the reproduction, computer reconstruction of the pacemaker of the heart and its robustness, you can describe that, as many genetis, geneticists do, as a form of genetic buffering. That is to say, the regulatory networks in the cell are insensitive to many of the variations that occur at the genome level. Remember, the demonstration was that a protein that was contributing 80% functionality, only changed the functionality by 10%. And in general, organisms are very good at doing this, as it were, to use a metaphor, immunizing themselves from their genomes. And you've seen this slide already, so I'll speed it up. Um, the mechanism, of course, that I discussed earlier, by which you can do it in the heart. But how general is it? This is a beautiful study by Hillen Mayer and his colleagues um, a few years ago, 2008, in which they looked at the 6,000 genes you can find in the tiny unicellular organism yeast. And they knocked them out one by one, just one at a time, of course, to see what it did to metabolic and reproductive function. 80% of the knockouts were silent. No effect until you stress the organism by removing one of its metabolites on which it depends. And then the regulatory mechanisms do just as in that pacemaker model. They find another way of doing it with existing mechanisms which are still there. You then need to stress the organism by removing some mechanisms or the metabolites that they use to show the functionality. One way of representing that, therefore, Constructed with a few colleagues a few years ago, where we see the phenotype not being directly related 
via the genotype, but only related through the biological networks. It means that you need to have at least two knockouts and possibly more sometimes in order to get through to the phenotype. And it might be more, of course. So let's now move on to the implications of these observations from computational systems biology to the popular view of evolution, which I'm sure you probably were all taught in school. It is a gene-centered view, accumulation of random mutations followed by selection, and that that is entirely sufficient. Now, I'm sure that occurs. So please don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that the standard story doesn't happen at all. I'm saying that often there are instances that uh, break that particular rule, if it's interpreted as being the only way in which it can occur. It also supposes the impossibility of the inheritance of acquired characteristics, um, sometimes actually miscalled, but that's a historical question, sometimes called Lamarckism. It distinguishes between the replicator, that is the genes defined as DNA, and the vehicle, which is the phenotype. And because of that link between Schrodinger's ideas on the idea of the DNA being a kind of crystal, and read in a very determinate way, it was actually partly responsible for Watson and Crick's idea of the uh, central dogma of molecular biology. And I will now show that all those rules have been broken. So let's go to genome reorganization, which is natural genetic engineering. The great Shapiro, remember he's the Chicago biochemist, and bacteriologist who wrote the book Evolution, A View from the 21st Century. He asked the question, are mutations entirely random? Which is the central question in relation to that half of the standard story. And he writes, it's absolutely correct, it is difficult if not impossible to find a genome change operator that is truly random in its action within the DNA of the cell where it works. Just to return briefly to the immune system, which I referred to earlier on, that is true in the way in which your immune system evolves a way of dealing with a novel invader. What it does is to target the mutations necessary to generate the antibody to that new invader at just precisely the region that codes for the variable part of the immunoglobulin to make it possible to find a solution. That's targeting, it's not mutating everywhere in a random way throughout the genome. Um, he also pointed out that when you look at the genome sequencing at the turn of the century, published 2001 in Nature, you notice something very interesting in that Nature paper, which is that if you look at transcription factors, those are proteins that control the genome, and at chromatin binding uh, proteins, which of course are responsible for forming the chromosome, you find clear evidence in comparing the genome sequences of different species that they must have used um, that process of natural genetic engineering, because you don't find gradual accumulation of random mutations, you find that whole parts of the genome have been moved around, even from one chromosome to another. Here's the discoverer of that process. Barbara McClintock discovered that process 70 years ago, working on corn. She demonstrated, of course, she couldn't view DNA, she had no molecular biological techniques, but she was light microscopying, <laughs> anyways, using light microscopy to view the chromosomes in the plant corn. And she found that chunk one chromosome would move to another one in response to stress to the organism. She was told to stop publishing on that in 1957 because nobody could believe her. Thirty years later, she was celebrating winning the Nobel Prize for Physiology and Medicine, um, and she wrote this beautiful uh, phrase in her Nobel Prize lecture published in Science um, in 1984. 
and she said that future attention will be centered on the genome and with greater appreciation of its significance, and now read the rest in red, as a highly sensitive organ of the cell. Remember how the cell communicates from down there in Munich to here in Aachen through those pathways. We didn't know about those when she was giving that Nobel Prize lecture, but she's absolutely correct. The organism knows how to make that communication. Responding to those um, by restructuring the genome. This, of course, is the idea that James Shapiro expresses in his book. What's the evidence? Here it is. This is from the first publication in 2001 of the full sequencing of the human genome, but comparing it with, for equivalent proteins, these are actually chromatin proteins, in yeast, worm, fly, several vertebrates, and a human. And the domains, these of course, these symbols are all individual domains in the protein sequence of amino acids, but they correspond, of course, to individual functional domains in the genome itself. And the stars show which ones have moved in the course of evolution from um, one region of the genome to another to create the new protein sequence. And you see there are many stars whole functional groups of sequence have moved around the genome. We now know how that can be done. The discovery of reverse transcriptase makes it possible for DNA in one region to be transcribed into an RNA, which then can be reverse engineered to be uh, transcribed into another part. There are also mechanisms by which that can be done without the RNA intermediate. Now we come to the speed up of evolution. If you give two children a set of Lego bricks and ask them to build a bridge, and I imagine to the first child you give the original Lego bricks, which is just a pile of those tiny pieces, but to the other child you give preformed architectural pieces, which can also be incorporated into Lego. And you ask the question, who will get to building the bridge first? It's blindingly obvious that the child with preformed structures will get there first. I'm suggesting, as James Shapiro does in his book, that evolution has used precisely this process for speeding it all up. So, natural genetic engineering, I would suggest, speeds up the pace of evolution. Uh, and so also, this is the last part of my talk, uh, does the acquisition of acquired characteristics, because that, as it were, takes a characteristic that has occurred as a consequence of change in the soma cells, which then has to be transmitted to the germline. That's, of course, what standard evolutionary <coughs> biology said was impossible. Biologists are finding the mechanisms by which that happens. Microsomes come out of cells with DNA or RNA in them, and they travel through the bloodstream. Many of those microsomes go down through the sperm line. There are paternal effects in the transmission of characteristics. There are also maternal effects that get transmitted through the egg line. And there are various ways in which it can happen. This is a very good example of the inherent characteristic published in Cell um, in, I think it is 2011. Um, they were using the small planarian worm, C. elegans, a great favorite, of course, of, of geneticists. Uh, because it's got a, a particular number of cells. It's a very, if you like, determinate organism. Some way to respond to an RNA silencing mechanism. Now that's well known, but colleagues had a brilliant idea. Suppose we cross those worms with wild-type worms that don't have the right DNA. Now, the first cross will naturally have them because the um, parents will contribute equally to the genomes of the offspring. But if you carry on doing that through several generations, following Mendel's laws, you will eventually end up with some of the worms not having the right DNA. Yet, they have inherited the robust response 
to the viral infection. How do they do it? Demonstrated by Rav and his colleagues, the RNAs go down through the germline. And then each generation of organisms uses RNA polymerase to multiply up the number of RNA molecules. And it's a very simple way in which the transmission through the germline can occur in response to an acquired characteristic. That was by um, transmission through the germline of an RNA. This example, which comes from the work of Joe Nadeau and his colleagues um, in 2012, published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, comes from looking at a particular um, mutation. It was an APOBEC1 deficiency, but don't worry about the technical details of that. Um, the fact is that they found epigenetic effects, that's marking of the genome, usually with methyl groups on the cytosines, that persists for many generations and is strong in inheritance, a standard genetic um, inheritance. There was a commentary article in that uh, issue of PNAS because the, the observation was so important that it required a commentary. The commentary simply says the belief that the soma and germline do not communicate is patently incorrect. At that time, we didn't know about microsomes communicating RNAs down to the germline, nor did we know about some of the other molecular mechanisms. By but that commentary article had been fully justified by the development since. Um, I include this slide because I think it beautifully illustrates that vastly more must be transmitted to the next generation than just the DNA or the nucleus. This is a cross-species clone. An um, organism on the left is a goldfish. The organism on the right is a carp. And what they did was to take an egg cell fertilized from the goldfish, then remove the nucleus and replace the nucleus with the nucleus from a cell from the carp. You should, of course, if you follow the standard story, get a carp. What you get is intermediate. This has a number of vertebrae, which is about 36. This has a number of vertebrae, which is, sorry, it's the other way around. The goldfish has about 26. This has about 36. This one has a number that's intermediate between the two. The title of the paper by Yong Ha San and his colleagues from Wuhan at the Fish Institute in China gives a mechanism. It says the cytoplasmic influences on, and I forget the rest of the title, but it's obvious that factors in the cytoplasm uh, of the egg cell, which remember came from the goldfish, are influencing the development of the organism. Um, in fact, this is, the, this is the detail on the goldfish at 26, the carp actually 33 in this particular case, and the carp nucleus in the goldfish egg uh, produces 28, which is intermediate between the two. Even the icon evolution, which is the Galapagos finches, has been shown to be dependent upon epigenetic transmission. This is a beautiful study by Michael Skinner and his colleagues looking at four of the um, Darwin finches and looking at the number of genetic, uh, DNA, and epigenetic, that's marking of DNA, changes in the two. And of course, as you increase the phylogenetic distance between the finches, you find the differences accumulate, but both the DNA changes and the marking changes uh, correlate. And in fact, if you wanted to ask which correlates better, it's actually the epigenetic. I put to Michael Skinner the question, do you think the epigenetic changes came first? And he said, well, I don't think it could be, because I think once you have epigenetic changes, you will automatically into the genome. Actually, the great embryologist Conrad Waddington way back in 1957 in his beautiful book um, on the genes, he called it the strategy of the genes, uh, showed that mechanism. He cultured fruit flies and showed how a change that occurs in response to, to uh, a stimulus embryo, a wing appearing in the example, 
could be assimilated into the genome after only about 14 generations. So we already know how that can be done. Now I come to the last part of the lecture, and it's just two or three minutes to present you with an interesting calculation, because so far what I've shown is that genome, uh, sorry, that phenotypes are very good, that is organisms, are very good at, as it were, immunizing themselves against genetic variation. That itself poses a problem for how you go from genome information to phenotypic uh, functionality. But it gets even worse when you consider the total number of interactions there could be in a genome of 25,000, which was, of course, the number of genes thought to exist in the human. The number varies a bit according to the way in which you define a gene, but take 20 or 25,000 for granted for the moment. Assume that each function depends on two genes. That's absurd, but it still would give you um, 25,000 times 24,999 divided by 2, you'd get 300 million. I'm rounding the figures, of course. That, incidentally, is the number of double knockout strains of mice you would need in order to investigate all of those, and we will never make 300 million separate strains of mice. But it gets worse, of course, if you make the assumptions even more realistic. Um, in some of those cardiac models that I showed you at the beginning, we have up to 100 um, uh, components. These would be components coded for by DNA. And if you allow that number, you get 10 to the 300 as the number of possible combinations of functionality. But of course, there's no reason to restrict nature to using only 100. What we're finding out from GWAS studies, the genome-wide association studies, is that in relation to some characteristics, particularly disease characteristics, complicated diseases, particularly of older people, you need to look at thousands in order to get the correlations to be significant in relation to coding for a particular function or disease. If you allow, therefore, any number, you get this number 10 to the 70,000, and I'm sure most of you appreciate already that that exclamation mark does not mean factorial. <laughs> so, how huge is this number? I thought it best to compare it with the largest object we know, and we know how many components the largest object has because that marvelous telescope, Hubble, in its deep field view has enabled us to work out how many galaxies there are out there. And from that, when you work out how many galaxies there are in the Hubble deep field view and multiply up by the um, fraction that he's using, that the, the Hubble is using as a fraction of the sky, uh, you get the total number of atoms in the universe to be 10 to the 80, which is a little bit small compared to the number of possible relationships there can be between 25,000 genes. Now, the implication of that is obvious. They never existed. Most of them never happened. Because there wouldn't be enough material in the whole universe for nature to have tried out all of those possible variations and interactions in a random way, even over the long period of the billions of years of the evolutionary process. So, to close, a little bit of further reading. Um, there's um, an article in the Journal of Experimental Biology which looks at evolution beyond the standard story of neo-Darwinism. There's um, Actually, it's already appeared. The one in 2017 in Interface Focus has actually already appeared in 2017. And I take a quote from um, a focused issue of the Journal of Physiology focused on evolutionary biology and physiology. Nature is even more wondrous than the architects of the modern synthesis thought, and it involves processes previously believed impossible. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir.